the Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Rick Schnabel literally untrained his brain of poverty cycles, years of abuse and a resulting low self-esteem melted away. He explains it all in episode 5. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Hello and welcome to the Healing Through Love Show. I'm your host, Charlene Lynch from charlenelynch.com. Healing Through Love is a social enterprise whose vision is to shift awareness on domestic and family violence within the community and to support the victims and survivors. Our mission is to provide family and domestic violence survivors with a soft place to land by offering services available to them and their families. We interview experts and survivors who share their personal stories and offer advice to those who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey to heal. As well as the Healing Through Love podcast, we also have an annual Pamper Day here in Adelaide, South Australia, for survivors of domestic and family violence. Our local businesses come together and pay it forward, providing their services and resources for the day to give our survivors a much needed and deserved day of indulgence. Now, today I've got a very special guest. Back in 2004, Rick Chernobyl, um, and I may not have pronounced that right, so I'll keep working on that, Rick, studied at the world's most powerful change makers. They taught him how to heal his past, change his mindset and become a force for good for the world. Now with over 38, thousand brain untraining hours under his belt. He is now a multi, multi bestseller author and a world-class NLP, so that's Neuro Linguistic Programmer, Master Trainer and Leader Life Coach and Life Coach Trainer and Radio Host and a force for good in the world. Welcome, Rick. Hey, Charlene, how are you? <laughs> pleased to meet you. It's pleased to e-meet you. And I'm so excited that you've come back here to the Healing Through Love podcast to share what's happening new in your life. And also it'd be great to reiterate a little bit of your story so that listeners who haven't heard from you before can understand where you've come from and where you are now and how you pay that forward in the universe. Cool. Fantastic. Happy, happy to share. So, Rick, tell us a little bit about what got you here to where you are now. I think um, the thing that I've come to understand is that your life is actually perfect, even though at times in your life you don't realise it is. And uh, I came from a family of, let's call them, hitters. And, you know, basically both my parents you know were immigrants that migrated to australia that had experienced a second world war had seen an incredible amount of violence had an incredible amount of trauma through their lives so as far as they were concerned to actually hit your child when they were doing something wrong was quite normal for them But of course, you know, me being a child growing up and experiencing all this, it was far from normal. It, um, you know, it it, it bloody well hurt for a start. And uh, it certainly created an enormous amount of trauma for me. So, you know, naturally, one of the things I've come to understand is that, you know, we as people, we're we're very much like animals in that when uh, you've heard the story about elephants going out to die we're the same we we do exactly the same sort of thing when we're hurt what we typically do is we retreat from the tribe so we shelter we go fetal we hide away and uh, and i was no different i wanted to hide away a lot 
if you're being hit a lot, particularly at a young age, you, you actually start thinking there's something wrong with you. So my best friend was a library card and I spent so much time in the library and because it was a safe place, you know, there were uh, responsible adults kind of looking after the space and it was very quiet, very peaceful and spent a lot of time, you know, they had these little carpet risers and I used to sit on there, grab a book and start reading and escape, you know, mentally from, you know, what my home life was like. And uh, eventually I got bored with the kids books and kind of migrated around to the adult section. And I found the psychology section when I was seven years old and started picking books out that kind of resonated with me. And I can't say I fully grasped the concepts, but there was a lot of, you know, ahas coming on. And I started to get this idea that we could change, you know, that we could be different. And of course, because I was being hit, I thought there was something wrong with me. So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to work out what was wrong with me. And I really wanted to fix that. And that was the beginning of my journey that ultimately led me to, you know, study psychology, neuro-linguistic programming, EFT, TFT, you know, all sorts of all sorts of various healing modalities, of course, to heal me first. And, and then once I came through the other side, I couldn't shut up about my healing. I couldn't, I couldn't stop talking about how much my life had changed and how my world had opened up. And, uh, and then a good friend of mine said, um, you should put this in a book. You should write about this. There's some cool things going on here that you've learned. So I did. And it became a bestseller and people started contacting me from all over the world and started asking me, you know, can you coach me? Can you heal me? Can you help me? Can you teach me to do what you do? And, and so our world just kept evolving and growing as more and more people wanted help. And of course, then you start getting all these case histories and testimonials and all that sort of thing. And uh, people started seeing the sort of changes that, you know, we were able to do with people. And that brought on more people and uh, the world got a bit crazy, but uh, in a much better way. I love it. Now, with all of those modalities under your belt, Rick, what is your favourite modality? I think the one that has the most solidity to it and probably the most, it meets a couple of needs. It meets the real science side of me. And it also meets the artist side of me, and, and that is neuro-linguistic programming. Because uh, I guess for me, I use a lot of modalities, but I find a lot of the NLP stuff really creates very quick change. You know, very, very fast. Like um, we had a guy just last week who was in our program, you know, learning NLP and learning life coaching and how to shift his life. And I could see this sadness going on in him. And he, we were doing this one particular technique, which of course I always need demonstrations. So I said, okay, students, I need a demo. I need someone who has some trauma that wants to get rid of it today. And uh, he volunteered. And the trauma that he experienced was actually losing his son. And uh, he said he was the only one that actually saw his son's blue eyes. And then his son died, you know, fairly soon after being born. And that he carried that trauma around for 30 years. And, you know, after we did this process, he came out of it completely different. And the real fundamental thing there is that your memory is only a memory of the last time that you remembered it. So memories do shift and change. You know, and, you know, many of the processes that are in NLP are very much about shifting our memory. Uh, for example, many years ago, do you, do you know the band ACDC? <laughs> yes, I'm old enough to remember that, Rick. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, they played at our school and, and I would swear black and blue that their bus that, you know, they had that 
you know, they used to tour around the place was yellow. And that was in my memory. That was my mind. And I could have sworn it was yellow until I read Mark Evans book. And I started reading his book and then he started talking about this blue bus. And I went, no, it was yellow. <laughs> of course, he should know, not me. But see, the Simpsons had happened somewhere through that. And the bus that is on the Simpsons looks very much like the ACDC bus and it was yellow. So my memory had shifted from blue to yellow. And so that's the thing that is fundamental that, you know, when we think about trauma, what happens is it, of course, finds a place, finds a home in our brain. And it tells us that the world is unsafe. It tells us, don't ever do that again. Don't ever put yourself in that predicament again. And so as a result of that, what happens is we stymie our life. We hold ourselves back. We stop putting ourselves out there. We retreat. And so when you can get into the memory and you can start to polarize the memory because the brain is, I've discovered is just like a computer, zeros and ones, yeses and nos. And when you can get into the brain and you can fire off different neural pathways and when you do it well, you can fire off two pathways at the same time. And, you know, as I say, neurons that fire together, wire together. And so what happens is it forms a new memory. And when it forms a new memory, the person can't be the same. Mm, I love it. Okay, I've got two questions for you. Yes. Uh, so question, I'll say both questions because I might forget them. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that sort of a day. So question one is, you know, what, um, with your background of NLP and your other modalities, what's your opinion of affirmations and affirmations? Like how do you, where do you think they fare in the process? Yeah. And how attached does a person really need to be to dive into what really happened rather than just sort of cutting off and making a decision to create a new story? Two questions. Cool. Okay. I'll ask the first one, the affirmations. Now, affirmations have some validity. They really, really do. I don't believe they're the panacea. Um, they were invented by a man called Emil Cooey, who used to work at a kind of cancer clinic where people just 100% of people came into his hospital and 100% of people died. And he just thought to himself, something's got to change here. I can't tolerate just being here watching people die. So he got this crazy idea that he started telling everyone, I want you to say this as often as you can. And he came up with this every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. And they'd chant it and they'd sing it and they'd say it constantly. Now, the numbers changed. Instead of 100% of people coming in and dying, I can't remember the figure, but it was like 78% or 72% or something like that. So he had an impact. It actually did make a difference. Now, the thing is that essentially affirmations, what they do is they can certainly help you. However, if you don't believe those affirmations, then you may as well just be hit on the head with a baseball bat, you know, um, because they just like if, if you're let's say your world is incredibly impoverished. You, you look in your bank account, you got zero dollars. Um, you haven't got a job. Just simply saying, you know, my pockets are filled with money, you know, isn't going to all of a sudden make money appear in your pockets. And in fact, it's going to hurt if you keep saying that because it's actually a full blown out lie. And so in that context, um, that's where affirmations really kind of compete with your neural programs and your belief systems and your factual reckoning. Um, so they can be helpful, but um, they certainly need a lot more VAK in them. In other words, more pictures, more sounds and more feeling. And if you can congruently completely believe the affirmation, I think it goes somewhere to help. But I don't think it's the panacea. I don't think it, it's a band aid. 
No, I get that. So it's like having a car without an engine. So just saying the words is just the car, yep. but having the feelings, the visualizations, the sensations and making it real for you in your imagination is like putting the engine in the car. Yeah. So, and so then how, so then what's your thoughts? I know you've got another question to answer, but yeah. this is connected, but then what's your thoughts in and around cognitive dissidence then in and around like saying affirmations and how does that play into also NLP in general? Um, is that play a part? It plays, it, well, linguistics part of the L, the NLP is very, very important, of course because neuro-linguistic programming is very much about, okay, so let's identify your problem. Let's find out where that problem is actually stored. How do you remember it? How did it come together? Where do you feel it in your body? And why do you feel it there? And so there is a, there, there's a very clever process called submodalities in NLP. And essentially what you can do is you can actually it's so shifting that you can get someone who says i love chocolate and i don't want to eat it anymore because i keep eating too much chocolate or i love beer and it's not good for me and i want to stop drinking beer there's this process that essentially takes about 30 minutes and you can get a person who loves chocolate who loves drinking beer all of a sudden never ever eating chocolate never ever drinking beer again and it's based on how our neurology is is linked to certain things so the moment you think of anything anything there will be an associated picture like let, let me do this with you if it's okay yes so, i love it Rick. do it do it do it okay so what i want you to think about is i want you to think about okay i'm going to take you here but i want you to think about a sad time think about a sad time so just Notice that sad time and when you've got it, you're there. Okay, so what I want you to do is I now want you to calibrate it. 10 is it's really sad, zero it's not. Where would you be right now? 10, okay, cool. So what I'm gonna get you to do is notice the picture that springs to mind when you associate to this sadness. Have you got a picture? Okay, tell me, is it color or black and white? Color. Okay, is the picture close to you or far away? I'm in the picture. I can see uh, it's it's close. Okay, cool. So how big is the picture? Uh, it's full screen. Okay, so now uh, where do you feel it in your body when you look at this picture? Right there. Yeah, yeah, you keep touching there. So tell me about the size of this feeling. It's huge. Okay, so watch what happens when we do this. What I'm going to get you to do is I want you to change that picture from color, make it black and white now. So just take all the color out of it. Now I want you to shrink the picture, make it very, very small. It's getting smaller now. It's almost about the size of a postage stamp. And now what I want you to do is take yourself out of the picture. You can't see yourself in the picture anymore. Or you can't see the picture anymore, but you can see yourself in the picture. Can you see yourself in the picture? Tiny. Very small. And now, where is the feeling? Where has it gone to now? Uh, I can feel it there, but I don't know if that was just me thumping. Um, but yeah. it's not. It's not. Um, it's not sharp or uh, getting my attention. Yeah. Okay. Now, bring the feeling down. Let it go down your body. Let it go down to about your knees so just let it go all the way down there okay begin to notice how different it feels now it feels different now doesn't it mm. okay calibrate that event from zero to ten where would it be now yeah it's manageable so what would the number be uh i'm gonna say i'm still gonna say it's pretty high but it's a a terrifying event um yeah. so i'm gonna say uh it, it, i can say a seven comfortably okay yeah? now let me take you through another process now what i want you to do is i want you to rise above the event okay have a look at the event okay now what i'd like you to do is i want you to have a look at the event but this time you're moving up into a much wiser place and as you look at the event now, 
I'm going to ask you as you move into this wiser place, I want you to begin to learn from it. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes we have to be in very scary events to become courageous. In other words, you cannot be you know, courageous without fear. So begin to notice what you're actually learning. I mean, life teaches you things and sometimes it's got to teach you through tragedy. Sometimes it's got to teach you through trauma. But understand that, you know, no one's got it in for you. This was not a lesson that you had to pay for. This is a lesson you had to learn. So what I'm going to get you to do now is just begin to learn from this. Now, I know that we're public right now and you don't have to turn this personal, but I want you to get a sense of what is it that you didn't learn when you experienced it. But now that you're experiencing it from a completely different perspective, what are you now learning from this event? What did it aim to teach you? Mm -hmm. Have you got the lesson? Yeah. Okay. So how important is this lesson in your life? How much do you need this lesson? Pivotal. It's pivotal. So it's really important, isn't it? Hmm. So in truth, in some way, this event almost had to happen, didn't it? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Yeah. So now as you begin to get the wisdom, take in that wisdom. Take in that wisdom like you're going to use it. Taking that wisdom like you're going to now turn a tragedy into an opportunity. Now, I mean, this cost something. So now let yourself reap the rewards. So I want you to now think that you are now moving forward in your future, but you're now using this lesson. You're now seeing yourself using this lesson. Mm. And notice the benefits that you get as a result of using this lesson now. Mm -hmm. And now begin to feel your heart taking on the value, like you can accept the value of this lesson. Mm -hmm. It's changing, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. And now as you begin to get a sense of this, here is what I want to give you as a little gift. The thing that I want you to really understand is how clever are you? How wise are you? But more so, how courageous are you to accept this lesson in the first instance? See, sometimes we completely underestimate how amazing we are. It's like it. I love it. How do you feel? I love it. I'm a bit choked up. Um, for the listeners, you know, uh, re-listen to this and place yourself into your challenge and uh, and just l listen to Rick's words and go through the process and you'll, you'll see it's reprogramming. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, Rick. That's You're welcome. So tell me, where are you right now from zero to 10? What number now? You know, it's still um, a life altering tragedy. Uh, yeah. It's still powerful. It's now, at, it's under five um, and uh, and I'm soaking in the, the goodness. Yes. Awesome. Yes, I still have a way to go and that's okay because I'm on a human adventure. <laughs> Absolutely, but that's not bad in 10 minutes, huh? That's fantastic. I, <laughs> I am a bit of a... Um, I do like NLP. Um, so um, Michael Grinder is a friend. and uh, Oh, okay. I yeah. love Michael Grinder. He's a oh, lovely man. Oh, I love him so much. He's, yeah, he's like, a lovely uh, man. He's uh, like our grandfather. And uh, <laughs> I love watching him when we go out for dinner and he does the thing that he does where he can just tell you everything about yourself. Who you are. Didn't want to know. Oh, yeah. Just from using body language and uh, the artful skills in and around NLP. So, yeah, yeah love it. I love, I, it's one of my favorite modalities. So, yeah, yeah I love it. And okay. Michael, sorry, Michael's a lovely, lovely man. I, I met Jimmy Barnes with Michael. Get out of here. That's. I, I was um, I did some training with Michael years ago and, you know, he said, where where can I get a gelato around here? And I said, follow me. So we went and we got a gelato and Jimmy Barnes happened to be there. 
<laughs> and I, I said, Michael, you need to meet Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. and it was fantastic. I got them in conversation. So it was oh, lovely. I, I love it. I'm a huge fan of Michael and his beautiful wife. And they do a beautiful couples program as well now, which is lovely. So do you remember the third question? The third question was how we associated to to the trauma, to the event, yeah? And how can we disassociate from that? Was that kind of the question? Yeah, Did I get it? Like, yeah, I threw cognitive dissidence in there in between. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first, uh, so yes, yes. If you can if you can dive in a little bit deeper to that, that'd be great. The the first thing that is not an easy thing to hear, but it is the truth. And that is that the first thing that we have to understand is that at any one given second, we can take in about 2 million bits of information. But, you know, our brain can't process all of that. So what it does is it deletes, distorts and generalizes the data and information down to about 134 bits. So that's well over a million bits completely vanish. So what that tells us is that tells us that what we do is we jump to conclusions really quickly and we make assessments, we make judgments about certain events and certain things and certain people. And as a result of that, we hate being wrong and we hate not agreeing with our beliefs. I mean, everyone agrees with their beliefs. So the truth is that life is actually the greatest illusion that we could ever experience. But we hate that. We hate uncertainty. We love certainty more than air. And when we're uncertain, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to conclusions really quickly. And so as a result of that, what we do is we make these decisions. And of course, it's very much like I was referring to earlier, the brain being zeros and ones. It's yes and no, good or bad. So we'll make these judgments. But what can often happen, and I noticed this, um, when I first came out of training, one thing that I really wanted to specialize in was depression because you know I thought I had depression and came right through it, through my training, of course. And the thing is, I couldn't wait to work with my very first client who had depression. I remember I did a training for a company and this guy came up to me and he was a bit coy. And he said, um, I wonder whether you can help me. And I could see that his face, you know, what he was doing with his body language. I could see that there was something going on there. And then uh, he said, do you have a card? And I pulled out my card. My card had brain untrainer on it. And he went, yes, you can help me. <laughs> and so he never filled out a pre-coaching questionnaire or anything like that. But I remember when I caught up with him, um, I said to him, you know, he gave me the pre-coaching questionnaire. So I'm having a quick read as we're walking upstairs to go to my clinic room. And, uh, and I said to him, do you want to get rid of that depression today? And he went, obviously, you haven't, haven't read enough of my pre-coaching questionnaire. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I've had depression for six years and I've been on medication for four of those years. How am I gonna get rid of depression today? And I said, well, first thing we'll work on is your beliefs because the truth is you can get rid of it today, but there's a few things that have to happen. And one of those things is you've got to let go of this idea that because you've had six years of depression, that it's gonna take you probably another six to get rid of it. So you're going to wait for six years before you get rid of it. So let's get rid of the belief and then close that time frame. And I can remember he was my very last client for the evening. He came in at about eight o'clock, I think, from memory. And I said to him, look, you're my last client. I have the most understanding wife. And I said, would you be willing to just keep going until you get rid of the depression? And he said, what do you mean? How long are we going to be here? And I said, I'll be here till 2 a.m. 2 in the morning if you're ready to work that focused on it. And he said, I still don't believe we're going to get rid of it. So, okay, let's go. 
And I can remember I took about two and a half hours worth of notes because his belief system had to see me take down the data and detail until he went check. He knows exactly what's going on. In all honesty, those notes really didn't help a great deal in shifting things. But I remember we got to the very end of the session. It did take us about three hours, I must say, and two and a half hours of note taking. And I remember in the car park, he just kept shaking my hand and he just kept shaking my hand. And and I had to take his, literally take his, my hand out. And I said, you're confused now, aren't you? And he said, I don't know who to be anymore. He said, that was so weird. I feel so different. Like, I feel like this weight has come off my shoulders. And our languaging isn't sophisticated enough usually to say anything other than that. Usually most people say, I feel lighter, I feel brighter. Our vernacular isn't extensive enough in the healing space. We don't have enough linguistics around healing. And so essentially what happened was I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to call you within 24 hours to check on you to make sure that you're good. But I think you are. And I said, your deal is this. You're going to have to reinvent yourself now. You're going to have to reinvent yourself without depression. And you're going to have to train people around you who are probably walking around on eggshells, you know, not trying to upset you, etc., because of your condition. So I said, what I'm going to get you to do is start to really imagine you've got the Harry Potter one now and you go, right, what do I want? What do I really, truly want now that I haven't got that anymore? So a big part of moving forward is we do have to change our story. And that's really hard to do for a lot of people because We've been telling that one story over and over again to so many people or, or enough people who are close to us that we appear like liars when we go and do this process and then we come back different. It's kind of like we've got to readjust and go, oh, drop your head, drop your shoulders, look like you're down, look like you're depressed because we kind of feel ingenuine or and no one really wants to be a liar in truth. So the thing that we've really got to do is we're going to go through the point of reinvention. And, uh, and, and the biggest barrier to success is really belief. We've really got to believe at some level that there's an opportunity for us to shift and change. And, you know, uh, and one of the books that you were mentioning earlier, I, I wrote a book called Seven Beliefs That Will Change Your Life. And I wanted to be really detailed in that book. So I put so much information about beliefs and beliefs quite simply are on and off buttons. You know, we either believe it's true. It's an on button. We believe it's not true. It's an off button. We'll never do that. And so the first thing that often has to shift is our belief, a belief that something's possible, a belief that we can be different. And, you know, that can be the real shift. Does that make sense, Charlotte? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I'm always asking, is that really true, Charlene? Is it just true for you or is it really <laughs> actually true for everybody? And, you know, what else is possible? So I'm always, I live my days doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true because it's just checking in to see, you know, what part of the stories that we're telling ourselves are holding us in the patterns that yeah. we are currently behaving. And, you know, our preconceptions of other people as well. We hold them in our own story so that, and then change meets resistance. So we're not allowing others to to heal too by allowing them to have that instant healing for them Absolutely. to instantly change i know after i gave up alcohol after 30 years of being an alcoholic it it, it rocked a lot of people's world they were uncomfortable yeah yep. uh and to the point that you know they were running around going you're not an alcoholic uh you just drink a bit and i'm like no i'm actually <laughs> an alcoholic and uh, so isn't that fascinating now yeah. i've been sober now quite so many years and uh, just had an article just this week in uh, Channel 7 News, so the local news. And I had family members that were not happy with the article. Yeah. Just because it talks about I'm coming from a family uh, that drinks. So 
you know, it's, I think it's also our own stories and our family dynamic stories as well. And then we've got our greater community stories. Then we've got our nation stories, you know, yeah. which nation do we come from and our stories in and around that. And really, are they true? Or are they just true for us? And what would, what could be true if we changed it? Oh, I yeah. just, we could just change everything like that. Well, things can really shift quite fast. And I think one of the ingredients, certainly one thing that made it big for me was have a bigger reason than just yourself, you know, and, you know, like through our programs, when, you know, when people come in to learn neurolinguistic programming and life coaching, you know, I say at the beginning, I go, look, I respect that probably 50% of you here are here just for yourself. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. So I wanna know though, who's here to be a coach and help others and who's here for themselves? So who's here to be a coach? And there'll be about 50% of the hands go up and people go, yep, I wanna be a coach. Then by the time we finish the program, I then go, okay, I wanna find out, you know, who, who is now here to actually help others. And about 70% of people put up their hands now because they've now seen other people shift. They actually like the process of helping people. And most of us do. And so as a result of that, what happens is, I, I think I got really good as a coach and a trainer when it was no longer about me and it was about my students and clients. Because you'll learn more and you'll do more and you'll get better when you have a bigger reason to you know, when you're actually doing it for other people. Whereas sometimes we don't do as much for ourselves. A little bit like the, the mechanic's car, you know, that, that scenario. Yeah, it's the accountant's books. Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. And I suppose I've got a question in and around. Uh, so I studied holistic psychology and I just noticed, like during that process, we lost a person to suicide. And uh, in that, then the counsellor came and had a conversation with one of the classes. And just surprising to see that in the area of psychologists, psychiatrists in that space, and then even and dentists was the other one as well, just the high incidence of suicide in yeah. those industries. And like, wow, um, what do you think that we, what, what do you think that says? And do you find something similar than that in the NLP space? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, haven't seen a lot of it in the NLP space, but I've certainly seen it in, you know, other areas of counselling and so forth. There, there's a part of us really being able to kind of protect ourselves through the process because many of us are quite, you know, empathic. And sometimes, you know, we've all sat there and watched a movie. And before we know it, we're in first position. And then all of a sudden, we're watching the movie. And now we're in second position, we're now one of the actors and feeling what they're feeling. So, so being that sometimes you can confuse your feelings with the people that you're serving. Because the first thing you think about when when someone comes to you, like, you know, you guys are from Adelaide there. And I remember I had a gentleman from Adelaide that called me and it was just before Christmas. And I know it's a critical time for a lot of people. And he was calling and I could hear in his languaging that he wasn't good. And so I said to him, I said, okay, look, here's what I want you to do. And I gave him some things to do. And I said, call me same time tomorrow. And so he did, he was great. He called me and he sounded a bit better, which was great. And then I said, okay, today, this is what I want you to do. And, but call me tomorrow, same time. And so he did. And so we built up this relationship over the phone. I had never seen him before or anything like that. The phone's great, you can be anonymous. And uh, then I started seeing the third time he was really starting to shift. He had a bit of a spark in his voice. He actually laughed, you know, at one of my dad jokes. And, um, and I thought, that's fantastic. He's really moving. And then I said to him, I said, have you ever thought that, you know, this conversation that we're having right now, that there's a bigger purpose for you? And there's actually purpose and reason that you had this problem in the first place. 
I mean, it's no surprise that you call me a trainer of coaches and people who learn neuro-linguistic programming. Why is that? You know, you could have called a lot of other people, but you called me. And he said, hmm. He's since gone right through our program. He is now a trainer and a coach teaching other people how to get beyond suicide. Mm. You know, so so the thing is that, you know, and boy, it, it really gets my alarm bells going whenever I hear any languaging that sounds a bit like that because I did lose one client once and um, it was it was horrible it was you know I just knew that he had one session and I knew he needed more and he said he felt quite a bit better at the end of it but I just knew it wasn't enough and it was it was actually my money stuff not his that was really the issue because I thought to myself, I should have actually said, come on, dude, we've got to book that next session. And, you know, he did, well, he had a lot more money than I realized, but I didn't think he was that well off. His brother had actually paid for the session. And then I contacted his brother and I said, look, I'm really concerned about your brother. And uh, by the time he called me back, he'd, um, anyway, I won't go into detail. But, um, you know, it, it makes you realize how important the work really, really is. And it makes you realize why it's important to get good at what you do. Mm. And, you know, you begin to realize, and I truly believe this, I believe that I'm not here for me. I don't think I was ever here for me. You know, I was actually, I had to have that domestic abuse in the beginning I had to go to the library. I had to go to the psychology section. I had to become an avid reader and a learner and do all of those courses and end up doing what I'm doing now. Um, it all stands to reason, you know. And um, I remember the, the weird thing, I spent a bit of time in advertising. You know, that was my first career and I used to be a creative director of agencies. And uh, I thought to myself, because I fell in love with coaching, fell in love with NLP. I said to someone once, you know, why didn't I find this earlier in my life? You know, I'd even be far more advanced than I am now. And, and he said, it's really interesting. Think about what you do for coaches now. You know, most of them have problems advertising, selling and marketing. And he said, you've been in sales, marketing and advertising. <laughs> and quite often you're helping these people know how to, you know, get clients because that's part of the deal. You've, you've got to be able to get good at getting clients because if you don't, who's getting helped? This is true. I love yeah. it. I could chat with you, Rick, all day uh, and it would be better with a cup of tea, I'm sure. <laughs> well, Rick, I understand. I've got a glass of water. <laughs> I've got a bottle. Have you got a water? <laughs> I've got a bottle. Um, I understand that uh, clients can work with you. They can actually have a taste test. Is that what we're calling it? Where They, they can. A, a bit of a nibble of you, Rick, and see <laughs> <A> nibble. <laughs> if you're their flavour. Is that right? Am I chocolate or vanilla? Or maybe <laughs> even caramel? <laughs> I love it. Is that true? Yes, they can, actually. Um, I've, got, I've got a program where we, you know, we give away a number of modules of our NLP program. And, you know, so they can get a bit of a taste of what NLP is all about. And we kind of like that because, you know, that gives people an understanding because it's a, you know, it's a commitment of time. It's a commitment of energy and money. And, you know, so it's nice to be able to get in there and just see what it's about before you about even commit. How are looking to heal? What about people that aren't necessarily looking to teach or to learn and to share their gifts. What about people that are, you know, in the first instance, because a lot of our listeners will be in the first instance yeah. looking to heal. Are you available for that as well, Rick? There is a, a thing that we have called a solution session. Now, what that is, I generally get on like a Zoom call or if they're a little bit shy, you know, we jump on a phone call. And so my job is to listen as well as I can take as many notes as I can and come up with some ideas for them to be able to move forward. And that session is completely free. Oh. And, you know, if they want to, they want some time with me, I usually dedicate about 30 minutes to an hour with them. Oh, and um, <laughs> thank you. Lovely, Rick. So I'd love to share. I've got a couple of links here. 
um, share that uh, with our listeners. So I'll pop that everywhere so they can find out. Uh, I've got two different links. One's talking about um, to the free NLP life coaching course. And the other one is a free solution session. So the solution session listeners is if you want to have a taste of Nick and the uh, the free NLP life coaching course is a little bit of a nibble at the um, the bigger course program if you're looking to actually educate yourself. Is that right? That's absolutely perfectly correct. Oh, I love it. Rick, Is have you got any closing words for our listeners today uh, in and around? So specifically looking at healing, because some of our listeners are still living in the story. <laughs> they're not yeah. just telling themselves, they're actually living in the story. And to transition from where they are to where they want to be, uh, it's not just about imagining, there's more than that. Is there any closing words that you can share with our listeners that can help them when they're in that unsafe space? Yeah, look, there, there is something that personally helped me a lot. And, uh, you know, I went through some incredible tragedies through my life too. And I remember once going to see a clairvoyant, you know, when I was out there searching and uh, she said something to me that really was a big game changer for me. And she said, you know, you're here to do what you do. And she said, you will always be highly protected. And now I don't know what your listeners might believe in, but, you know, be it God, Muhammad, Allah, Buddha, the universe, angels, guides, guardians, whatever it might be. It's one of those things that I love that space of spirituality because I know for me personally, I'm never working alone. Some of the things that come out of my mouth sometimes are completely from somewhere else. And you know, and and I feel that I have support around me that give me what I need to know in order to help. So the first thing is you may think that you're alone, but you're not. I really don't believe you are. I actually believe that there are no coincidences in this life, that you are meant to meet certain people at certain times. You are meant to get opportunities at certain times and your job is to follow them and believe that you're highly, highly protected. I'm also a big believer in magic. You know, things can happen so fast. And, you know, I've met over the years, I've met some incredible people who have come into our programs and, you know, that I've met, you know, at various seminars and networking things and so forth. And you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, oh, my God, I had to meet you and um, follow that intuition and really believe that there is a way out. There really truly is, you know, it's just your job to find it. Find that person, find that person who's going to help you, take you wherever you need to be. And that person might already be in your life, you know, and they might already be reaching out to you, but start to open up rather than close down because your natural mind will typically want to close down. So you've actually got to consciously open yourself up rather than close yourself down. Oh, Rick, I love it. Thank you so much for taking the time today to share with us on Healing Through Love. It's been a joyous occasion. We'll share Rick's links so that you can connect with him. And thank you so much, listeners, for listening with us today on the Healing Through Love show. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast. Podcast.